Hello and welcome. My name's Will McNeil. I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Southampton and I'm going to be talking about physicalism. So if you've come across the concept of physicalism, this will have been in relation to the philosophy of mind, in particular the metaphysics of mind, what the mind is, how the mind relates to the rest of the universe. But in its full generality, physicalism is a fully general claim. It's just the claim that everything is physical. In this presentation, we're going to be thinking about what that means in the philosophy of mind and whether it's plausible. But while we're doing so, I want you to be thinking, what does it really mean? What does it mean for something to be physical? For example, just to illustrate that there's a genuine question here, think about gravity or magnetism. These are aspects of the world described by physicists. It's not entirely clear that these things are physical. So keep that in the back of your mind. Meanwhile, let's think about why you might be motivated to be a physicalist. Why would you argue for physicalism? Well, I think the easiest way to understand this is to think about the alternative. What would it be to deny physicalism? Well, it would be to claim that not everything is physical, that some things are non-physical. The problem here is a problem of interaction. How is it, if we take something that's non-physical, that that thing would be able to interact with the physical stuff? Think about how physical things interact with each other. Well, in all of those cases, think about two pool balls hitting each other. We can understand that there's transfer of energy, that there's solid particles knocking into each other and all the rest of it. But as soon as something is non-physical, it's very hard to see how it could do any of that. After all, if it's non-physical, in what sense would it have any energy? It couldn't be solid. It wouldn't be able to make any difference to the physical world. Now, remember that physicalism is a concept usually employed in the philosophy of mind. And of course, we think that our minds do make a difference to the world. It was my desire for ice cream that means that there's no ice cream left in the freezer. My desire has had an impact on the physical world. So denying physicalism leads very quickly to a very nasty and knotty problem of interaction. So there's good motivation to pursue physicalism as a theory. And a good question to ask is what consequences that has? Well, I want you to notice that there's two possible claims that one could make about the mind if one accepted the truth of physicalism. If you think that everything is physical, then it looks on the face of it at least that you're committed to one of the following claims. Either the claim that minds themselves are physical, after all, they are something and everything is physical, so they must be too. Or notice that you do have an alternative. You can just deny that there are any minds. Then they're not things, and so they don't need to be physical, if they are, for instance, just fictions. And there is a view that you will come across called eliminativism, or what amounts to the same view, eliminative materialism, which is the view that indeed there are no minds. And this is a view intimately tied up with physicalism. But I want you to notice that if we're forced into that view, it is a very serious thing to be forced into. Now, sometimes as theorists, 
we do get pushed into accepting views that on the face of it seemed very unintuitive. So for example, in quantum physics, we find ourselves having to accept claims that seem very unpalatable about the existence and nature of objects. But we only find ourselves in that position because there's just no alternative in explaining everything that needs to be explained. So you shouldn't rush to accept eliminativism, even if you're a physicalist. You have first to push the common sense view that there are minds and given your interest in physicalism, then the view that minds are physical. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to accept that there are minds, and I'm going to ask the question whether this claim that minds are physical is plausible. Notice that if you start by accepting that there are minds, and you ask this question, then if the question turns out to be no, you therefore have some motivation to deny that physicalism is true. And then we'd be in the interesting position of having motivation to accept physicalism and some motivation to deny it. Okay, so what are we going to do for the rest of the talk? Well, I'm going to introduce you to two versions of the physicalist claim that minds are physical. The first is what we call type identity theory. Broadly, this is the view that minds and bodies are the same kinds or types of thing. So minds are just a type of body, a brain perhaps. I will present various arguments that make that type identity view seem problematic. And that leads us to a weaker version of physicalism, which I'm going to call token identity theory. This is the claim merely that whenever you have something mental, whenever you have a mental state or event, you have something which is physical. Then it looks like whenever you have something, you have something which is physical, so everything can count as being physical. But nonetheless, token identity theory is going to be shown to overcome some of those problems I will present for type identity theory. So what I'm going to do now is to explain the type identity theory in a little bit more detail, show you some problems with it, and use that to motivate thinking about this weaker claim that perhaps every token of a mental state, every particular individual mental state, might nonetheless be physical, even if types of mental state, types of thing minds, can't be identical to types of things, particular kinds of body. Okay. So, remember that the type identity theory is the claim that minds and bodies are the same kinds of thing. And I think there's a good way of summing this up, right? uh, a very common way of summing this up, is to think about a particular example. So instead of thinking about minds in general and bodies in general, let's think about pains. We all know them very intimately. If you were a type identity theorist, what would you say about a mental state or a mental event like pain? Well, the classic example in the philosophical literature is to imagine that there's a particular cluster of neurons called C fibers. This was once thought to be true. It's more complicated than that now in biological terms. But as philosophers, we can just hold on to this as a placeholder for whatever it is exactly that we tend to find pains correlated with. So if you're a type identity theorist, then you're going to say that this type of thing, this type of mental thing, pain, just is 
is identical with C fiber neurons firing. Okay, so this kind of thing, pain or the having of pain or pain events, is just the same kind of thing as these neurons, these sensory neurons firing in particular patterns. That's a nice, relatively simple way of trying to understand what type identity theory would really mean. But as I've said, there are some problems with this. Let's have a think about what they are. I think there's a really nice way of trying to get a headline claim about what the problems are with the type identity theory. Think of it like this, right? think about brains. Brains are full of squishy stuff, grey stuff, white stuff, blood, gunk, okay? That's what brains are full of. But think about minds, right? They're full of thoughts and feelings. Applying this to the identity that we thought about on the previous slide, right? Pain, well, that's a feeling-y kind of thing, right? We all know what pain is, we know it intimately, and it's a kind of feeling. But when you think about C fibers and their firings, that's a very different thing. Right? That's a chemoelectric charge being propagated down the axon of a neuron. So on the one hand, we've got brains, which are full of squishy stuff. On the other hand, we've got minds, which are full of thoughts and feelings. And squishy things and thoughts and feelings are not identical. Uh, but the type identity theory looks like it's committed to saying that they would be, as manifested by the claim that pain is identical to C fiber neurons firing. That's, I think, the headline concern. But I think there are some more careful ways of arguing for something which picks up on those intuitive worries. Let's think first about octopus pain. Here's an octopus. Octopuses are very sensitive creatures and they recoil in ways that we would associate with pain. And in general, it seems very plausible to suggest that octopuses feel pain. But octopuses have very different biological and neurological structures. And in particular, they don't have any C fiber neurons. Well, look, that must mean that pain can't be the C fiber firings, right? Because if you can have the pain without having the C fiber neurons, then the pain can't be identical. Just the same thing as C fibers firing. So that's one concern you might have, and this is called multiple realizability. Why? Because pain as a kind of thing, looks like it can be realized, made real, by lots of different kinds of physical stuff. Another way to see that is to think about a slightly different example. So perhaps you're concerned that octopuses don't really feel pain. Well, you know that you feel pain, right? And I can imagine a scenario where very subtly and very slowly, perhaps when you're asleep, Someone comes along and just very, very calmly and slowly swaps out your sensory neurons, your C fibers, with transistors, very special transistors, just in the sense that they do exactly the same job. They transmit information in exactly the same way that your sensory neurons would. So you're feeling the pain. Now I've swapped out all of your C fibers, your sensory neurons, with transistors. Intuitively, I think, you would still feel pain after this swapping had taken place. Why? Because well, all of the information is the same. All of the flows of information remain even when the C fibers have been replaced. So, if that's right, pain 
can't be neurons firing because we can have the pain without the neurons. Think of one more example. I think it's very easy when we're in this debate to think that there's something special about minds. But it's good to be reminded that there are other properties which look like they're not very obviously related to the physical natures of things. And here's a good example. It seems pretty plausible to say that there is such a thing as money, and in particular to say there are such things, such kinds of things as one pound coins. Here's the most recent iteration of the one pound coin. But one pound coins, like pain, are multiply realizable, or let's say one pound in currency is multiply realizable. Right? Because the old coin is different in shape, it's different in metallic constitution from the new coin, but it's still legal currency, you can still take it into a bank and get money for it. So we've got two things which both count as one pounds, which don't have the same physical makeup. So it looks like being one pound is multiply realizable in just the way the pain is. And indeed, in the old days, there were one pound notes. So these were things which were very different physically from either of the coins shown here. Much more like, you know, octopus neurons are to human neurons. But nonetheless, this was still just as much legal, legally counting as one pound as anything else. So it looks like there are lots of properties around which might count as being multiply realizable. Pain wouldn't be alone in that regard. Okay, so where have we got to? We thought about what physicalism was, the claim that everything is physical, and we thought what that might mean for the mind. And an obvious suggestion is that minds are just the same things, just the same kinds of things as some physical things, perhaps brains. And we took a more specific example and thought maybe something specific like pain was just the same kind of thing as some kind of physical thing or event. The example we chose was sea fibers firing. But it looked like there were some serious problems with that and some serious questions about why we should feel forced to think of things in that way. That leads us to what we call token identity theory, which is a weaker version of the claim that everything is physical. So remember that the token identity theory is the claim that each particular mental state is physical. So we've got some C fibers firing when you prick your finger, there's some X fibers firing when you prick the octopus's tentacle. And for the robotic arm that we've replaced your arm with, there are some transistors firing. Now, these are all different things, which means that we can't say that pain as a kind of thing is identical with any physical kind of thing. But nonetheless, notice that for each of these pains, there is a physical thing. And so it looks like this gives us a way of saying that everything is physical, which avoids the problems that we found earlier. It avoids the problem of multiple realizability. Good. So that's good as far as it goes, but I don't think we're out of the woods by any means. I think the first thing to note about token identity theory is that it can't really even count as being anything as grand as a theory. It's just not fleshed out enough. We still don't know anything positive about what minds are, how they relate in general to physical kinds of things or anything else like that. So at the very least, the token identity theorist needs to give us more by way of explanation. But I think there are also some more specific problems, and I'll mention a couple here. So I think the main problem with token 
identity theory is that we still have no understanding of how there are these special kinds of property. In other words, how there are these special kinds. Okay, what makes all these different, diverse, physical things? Pains. Okay, you've got the transistors firing, the X fibers firing, the C fibers firing. These are all just different kinds of physical events. And it's very unclear in what sense they all count as having the property of being painful. It looks like this property is something very different from any of the physical properties that uh, these things have, right? The, we know that the physical properties are all different. In the one case, C fibers, in the other case, X fibers, in the third case, transistors, right? Those are the kinds of physical things that are going on they're very different from pains. This leads to the thought that even if everything is physical, perhaps pain has got to count as some kind of non-physical property. Right? We know what the physical properties are, and they all sound different from each other and diverse, even though all of them seem to instantiate or realize the same mental property of being pain. So maybe the mental property of being pain is a non-physical one. But that raises a problem about causation, and I hope you'll notice that that problem is not a million miles away from the non-physicalist's problem about interaction. Okay, so here are your C fibers, and on this particular occasion, they realize pain, so they instantiate that property of being pain. And we also know that they're going to instantiate lots of physical properties. Okay, there's a series of physical processes here of chemoelectric charges moving down the axons, of synapses firing, and so on. But now it looks like we've got a battle going on. Say we ask why uh, the pain or why this event caused your hand to move away from the pin. Well, it looks like there's a battle between the claim that it was the property of its being pain that caused that movement or saying that it was these physical properties that it had right, that caused the movement away from the pin. And as soon as these properties, like the mental property of pain and the physical properties of axons firing and energy transfers and so on, look like they are in competition to be the kinds of things that make a difference in the physical world, it's going to be the physical properties, the physical processes, which win out. So why did your hand move away from the pin? Well, there's an obvious explanation. It's because there were these neural firings, there was energy transfer that made a difference to the stimulation of your muscles, and now we can understand why your hand moved. And we haven't mentioned pain at all. Pain looks like it's not interacting properly with the physical world again. So, the question is, where would we go next? And just to give you a couple of possibilities, we might just decide to be non-physicalists again, right? to use this as a reason to be dualists, even if perhaps we're now just property dualists. But notice that that gives us, or that retains all of these problems of interaction that we started with. We might want to think more deeply about how properties at the mental level, like properties that we talk about in mental terms, relate to physical properties. And to do that would be to start to explore supervenience as a way of understanding physicalism. So that's another possibility that you might be able to explore with your teachers. 
In the meantime, I will leave you with the problem of physicalism. And the problem is just this. There are very good motivations for being physicalist, but it's very hard to understand how we can be physicalists while still leaving room for mental states. On that note, thank you very much for listening. My email address is up and please do email me with any questions.